Hey everybody, welcome back to Race of History. Today we're getting into the next Napoleon video, Napoleon's Vietnam, Spain. Um, sorry this is a late upload today. I've had some internet issues all day, but we finally got them figured out. So let's go ahead and get started. In 1809, Napoleon Bonaparte, Emperor of the French, was at the height of his power. He had just won another crushing victory against Austria at Wagram, and imposed a humiliating peace treaty. But the war he'd started in Spain and Portugal, with his ill-judged invasion the previous year, continued to rage. Napoleon had placed his own brother, Joseph, on the Spanish throne, uniting a proud country against him. His troops had dealt ruthlessly with popular uprisings, while routing a succession of Spanish armies. In February 1809, Marshal Lann overcame the heroic defence of Zaragoza in a brutal siege that cost 54,000 Spanish lives and 10,000 French. What a wild picture that is. Holy cow. Look at that dude about to slam that cross into that soldier. Wow, that is a wild picture. But still, the Spanish and Portuguese remained defiant. And three months after their escape from Coruña, the British were back. In April, Sir Arthur Wellesley landed in Lisbon to lead a small Anglo-Portuguese army. British redcoats would fight alongside Portuguese troops, who, with the help of British training, would soon prove themselves highly effective. Three weeks after arriving in Portugal, Wellesley moved against Marshal Soult's 2nd Corps, which had recently taken Porto. Soult and his troops, preoccupied with plundering the region, had no warning of the British advance, and were soon in headlong retreat, back through the mountains into Spain. Having secured Portugal for the time being, Wellesley planned a joint campaign with General Cuesta, commanding the Spanish army of Extremadura. On the 10th of July, the two commanders met at Casas de Miravete to discuss strategy. Relations between these two allies were not straightforward. Spain and Britain had a long history of conflict. The Spanish were deeply suspicious of British intentions in Spain, while the British had a low opinion of the Spanish army, which they considered poorly trained and badly led. Um, yeah, I don't know how you could not be suspicious of Britain's intentions at this point. I feel like everybody kind of knows what Britain has been up to, what they like to do, um, <clears throat> how they like to use their navy. Um, so I don't know how, as Spain, you could not be a little wary of that. But also, um... I'm not sure what the specifics are with the Spanish army. Can somebody, like, let me know how this worked? Did they stay in the field once Joseph Bonaparte took the crown? Because normally, obviously, as the new ruler, he would get control of the military. So did the military leadership just consolidate and then keep the army out in the field? Or how exactly did that work? Did they get new troops? Were these the same ones as before? How, how did all this work? Wellesley's request to take over command of Spanish forces was rejected, but the generals agreed to a joint advance up the Tagus Valley towards Madrid, to be supported by General Venegas advancing from La Mancha. In the face of their advance, Marshal Victor's first corps withdrew to Talavera, where he was joined by King Joseph and General Sebastiani's 4th Corps. The French plan was for Joseph's army to defend Madrid, while Marshal Soult led three corps down from the north to get behind and trap the Anglo-Spanish forces. 
But Joseph, worried by Soult's slow progress and General Venegas' advance on Madrid, decided to attack at Talavera. This video is brought to you by our sponsor, Curiosity Stream, home of more than 2,500 documentaries exploring themes such as science, technology, and the natural world. Days right. free, thanks to Curiosity Stream. Yeah, go support Epic History. These videos are really good. For sponsoring this video. The Battle of Talavera saw British infantry bear the brunt of the French assault. They stood firm and repelled the enemy with disciplined musket fire and bayonet charges. Yeah, so this is what the British is kind of known for, and it continues well past this period. They are known as having an extremely small army. I mean, extremely small in comparison to the rest of Europe. But the, that small army is known to be well-drilled, uh, well-trained. They are precision shooters. I mean, this is, it's not one of those things where like it's a small ragtag group of, uh, you know, of a military force. The reason why the British military, not uh, as a whole, the British army is looked down on by the rest of Europe is because of how small the force is overall, not because of the training that they have. And so this is kind of a this is this is kind of a push and pull here, right? Because obviously Napoleon has the advantage in men in trained men for sure against the British and the Spanish. But again, when you're fighting a group where any civilian can be a hostile. It just totally, totally changes where you feel comfortable moving, where your supply lines have to go. Everything about the tactical nature of the battlefield changes when you're in terrain like this. I would say Joseph even leading this army is extremely dangerous because, you know, if you have a major army get beat in the field, and only the commanders are there, well, then that, that's just that army that's that's gotten taken. If the king or the head of a country is leading that army and you lose, you lose your country. I mean, that's you, you either outright lose your country or I guess in this case where Napoleon is actually the one, you know, pup, puppeting all these strings, um... You have the hugest negotiation ship ever in having his brother. Talavera was a small battle compared to the great clashes fought that year in Austria. But it proved that under Wellesley, Britain's small, well-drilled army was a force to be reckoned with, even though in the short term, victory achieved little. Warned of Soult's approach from captured dispatches, the victorious Anglo-Spanish army retreated. While King Joseph and Fourth Corps marched against Venegas' army, which they smashed at the Battle of Almonacid. Did they just leave that army there? Did they not tell them that they were withdrawing? What, what happened there? That seems wild that they just stood still and everybody else was retreating. That autumn, the Supreme Junta in Sevilla Free Spain's effective government raised two new armies for another attempt to liberate Madrid, planning to converge on the capital from north and south. But Wellesley, ennobled as Viscount Wellington for his victory at Talavera, had been so disgusted by the lack of Spanish cooperation that summer that he refused to risk his army. Predictably, Spain's inexperienced armies met with disaster. At Ocaña, they suffered their biggest defeat of the war, when a smaller force under Marshal Soult routed the Spanish army, taking 14,000 prisoners and 50 cannon. Jeez. A week later, the army of the left was heavily defeated at Alba de Tormes. There was more bad news when Girona fell to the French after an epic seven-month siege. 
the Supreme Junta's plans to retake Madrid were in tatters, and southern Spain was now wide open to French attack. That seems extremely optimistic, that, that quote there. In January 1810, King Joseph marched south with an army of 60,000 men. Spanish resistance evaporated. Spain's Supreme Junta was overthrown in a coup as Cordoba and Sevilla fell without a fight. Joseph, who still hoped to win over the Spanish with his progressive reforms, was welcomed by many as a saviour from anarchy. Only Cadiz held out, its defences reinforced by a British naval squadron, and was besieged by Victor's First Corps. Meanwhile, Napoleon sent Marshal Massena to Spain with 65,000 reinforcements. He was reckoned one of Napoleon's best marshals, and had just been made Prince of Essling for his heroics in the recent war against Austria. Massena was to lead a third French invasion of Portugal, take Lisbon and chase the British back into the sea. He laid siege to Ciudad Rodrigo, a fortified city controlling one of the main routes into Portugal, which surrendered after two weeks bombardment. Wellington, with only 33,000 men to face Massena's 50,000, retreated. Massena crossed the Portuguese frontier and besieged Almeida. After just 13 hours of bombardment, a lucky French shot hit the Portuguese magazine. 70 tons of gunpowder went up in a devastating explosion that made all further resistance useless. It was a serious blow to Wellington who'd been relying on Almeida's strong defences to buy him time. At Busaco, he found a strong defensive position, and made a stand. Massena's uphill, frontal attack failed, at a cost of 4,000 casualties. But the next day, the French found a way to outflank Wellington's position, and his retreat continued. As Massena's army neared Lisbon, his scouts reported something completely unexpected. Stretching across the Lisbon Peninsula, protecting the city from attack, they found a new chain of fortifications in two major lines. Known as the Lines of Torres Vedras, the British and Portuguese had been constructing these defences for more than a year. Now, the lines bristled with more than a hundred forts, redoubts, and batteries. Wow, okay, so when they decided that they were going to come back and then they pushed uh, France back out of Portugal, they went down south and started essentially just fortifying what was going to be their last stand. They were not going to give up this toehold. So, like, if worse came to worse and we got pushed all the way back, this is where we would go, this is where we're going to fortify. Is that what happened? That's brilliant, if so. Like, because, you know, if you're the British, you know you're not going to get 50,000 more men. You know, the, the British aren't going to send 50,000 reinforcements like the French can. So for you to say, okay, well, when they do send reinforcements, we're going to have this one place that we hugely fortify and we'll fall back and back and back and then this is where we'll make our stand. If that's what they did, that, that seems pretty brilliant to me. Manned by 30,000 troops and 250 guns, Massena soon discovered the lines were far too strong for him to attack. What's more, a scorched earth strategy had stripped the surrounding countryside of anything that might help the French. Smart while Portuguese partisans attacked French supply columns as they struggled through the mountains to reach Massena's army. Oh my god, okay, so everything here is perfect. It's, it's literally brilliant. So, like I said, whenever you have these, whenever you're in territory where everybody can be a hostile, 
it is really dangerous to have these super spread out supply lines because anybody can hit it, right? I mean, literally anybody, people you pass that look like civilians, as soon as your army's gone, they can start hitting that supply train. Um, also, because the, the fortification is at Lisbon, you can restock it by the sea. And the, of course, the British Navy is the thing that they have going for them. Everything about this and then the scorched earth. So then not only can you get resupplied by sea, but you keep the French who have this massive army and have to continuously resupply it. You keep them from being able to scavenge. You hit their supply wagons. Everything about this is brilliant. Massena faced a grim predicament. Starved of supplies, too weak to attack, <laughs> unwilling to retreat. But throughout... Somebody tell me whose idea that was. Was there a particular British or Portuguese general or politician or somebody? Whose idea was it to have the setup this way? This standoff, it was Portuguese peasants who suffered most of all. When their villages and farms were burned, many took refuge in Lisbon, where thousands died of starvation and disease. Jeez. Back in France, Napoleon had been preoccupied with his divorce from the Empress Josephine, and then a new marriage to Archduchess Marie Louise, daughter of the Emperor of Austria. She was now expecting their first child. Nevertheless, from Paris, Napoleon sent frequent orders to his marshals in Spain and Portugal, urging them to take more aggressive action. But when these orders arrived, weeks later, they were usually out of date, and showed little understanding of the problems his marshals faced. He now ordered Soult, based in Andalusia, to go on the offensive to draw enemy forces away from Lisbon, so Massena could take the city. Soult laid siege to Badajoz, a fortified city that controlled the southern route into Portugal. When 12,000 men of the army of Extremadura marched to its relief, they were routed by Soult, after which the city tamely surrendered, giving up 8,000 prisoners and vast quantities of stores. It was another heavy blow to Spain's armed forces. But remarkably, despite such disasters and their many blundering generals, the Spanish troops remained willing to fight, the courage of the rank and file undimmed. Victor's first corps, besieging Cadiz, had now been so weakened to support other operations that the Anglo-Spanish garrison decided to attack. The Allies landed along the coast to strike at the French siege lines from the rear. But they were ambushed by the French at Barossa. Despite heavy losses, the Anglo-Portuguese rearguard fought off the enemy, but a furious falling out between British commander Sir Thomas Graham and his Spanish counterpart, General La Peña, threw away any advantage. Soult, alarmed at these developments, marched back to Andalusia. Meanwhile, Massena, out of food and with no prospect of reinforcement, had no option but to retreat. Wellington's army pursued, discovering evidence of several appalling atrocities committed by the French against Portuguese villagers. There were running battles with the French rearguard, brilliantly commanded by Marshal Ney, until he was sacked by Massena for criticising his leadership. <laughs> Having chased the French out of Portugal, Wellington besieged Almeida. Massena's army, now rested and reinforced, marched to its aid. The two armies clashed again at Fuentes de Onuro. In two days of heavy fighting, Massena failed to break through Wellington's position to relieve Almeida. The fortress fell the next week, but to Wellington's fury, British bungling allowed most of the French garrison to escape. Massena had lost 25,000 men in Portugal, 
Now he'd lost Almeida too, and a string of bad decisions, not least to bring his mistress with him on campaign, had cost Yikes. him the respect of his officers. The Marshal, whom Napoleon had once nicknamed the Dear Child of Victory, was recalled to France in disgrace, never to hold senior command again. Napoleon sent Marshal Marmont to replace him. Meanwhile, Marshal Beresford, the British commander of Portugal's army, was sent to retake Badajoz with 20,000 British and Portuguese troops. When Soult approached with a relief force, Beresford marched to meet him at Albuera. It was one of the bloodiest battles of the war, around 6,000 casualties on each side, with more than a third of the British infantry killed, wounded or captured. Marshal Soult declared, There is no beating these troops, in spite of their generals. I always thought they were bad soldiers, now I'm sure of it. I had turned their right, pierced their centre and everywhere victory was mine. But they didn't know how to run. Soult had been checked, but he was determined to save Badajoz. The newly arrived Marshal Marmont marched to his aid, and they advanced again. This combined army forced the British to abandon the siege. But when Wellington withdrew to a strong defensive position across the Portuguese border, Soult and Marmont did not pursue. French commanders in Spain had learned grudging respect for Wellington, and for the steadiness of his troops. For now, the war in Spain had entered stalemate. While British, French and Spanish armies crisscrossed Spain and Portugal, another war was fought every day in the mountains, hills and woods. From 1808, Spanish and Portuguese civilians, militias and ex-soldiers began taking up arms against the hated French invader. They waged a war of ambushes and hit-and-run raids, known in Spanish as La Guerilla, the Little War. Its fighters became known in English as guerrillas. Britain's Royal Navy supplied vital weapons, stores and money, often landing them behind enemy lines. Much of Spain's rugged countryside fell under the control of the guerrillas. North of Madrid, Juan Martín Diez, an ex-soldier known as El Empecinado, the stubborn, led a guerrilla band 6,000 strong. In Navarre, Esposimina, a former peasant, ran a highly organised band that caused havoc for the French, capturing convoys and couriers on the strategic burgos Bayon road. So this is the perk for the British of having the huge navy, right? You're able to get supplies, you're able to kind of strategically coordinate with some of these guerrilla groups. It's much easier to do because you have total control of the seas, there is absolutely no threat to you as far as pushing your navy off the water. And so you're able to not only coordinate with them, but supply them, get them arms, get them ammunition. And in a war like this, you know, like has been the theme that we've been talking about, you gamble when you treat the civilian population as harshly as the French do. It's a huge gamble. Because the gamble is you're hoping that it dissuades any future resistance, right? That the punishment is so severe to resisting that they just won't do it. And that might work. But if it doesn't, if you don't come up seven on that roll, then you essentially push all of the civilians, even the ones that don't really want to fight, you push them into fighting, into taking up arms, into pushing back against the atrocities. And so, I mean, this is this is what civilians do, you know? When when they're treated this way, it is extremely likely that they will take up arms 
and they will start these kind of backyard guerrilla tactics. And uh, again, against conventional armies, they do real, real damage. Conventional armies do not fight well against guerrilla groups. They suck at it, even to the modern day. And branding Viva Mina on the forehead of collaborators. While in the West, Julian Sanchez, known as El Charo, led the self-styled Lanceros de Castilla. El Charo himself wore a French hussar's cap, its eagle symbolically turned upside down. Huh. There were dozens more bands operating across Spain, though a few were no better than bandits, terrorising civilians as often as the enemy. The guerrilla war was merciless, marked by hideous atrocities on both sides. A French soldier's greatest fear was to be taken alive by the guerrillas, yep. who often tortured their prisoners before killing them. Yeah, I mean, think about it. They're, they get pushed into this huge frenzy by the invasion and by the treatment of civilians. So what is their response going to be? Like, is their response going to be civility? Like, no way. They're coming to put their foot up your ass. Like, that's literally why they're doing this. So yeah, I bet the French were scared to death of these guerrilla groups. Tens of thousands of French troops were tied down by this people's war, guarding outposts or patrolling the countryside. The roads were so dangerous for French messengers that they required cavalry escorts of 200 men or more. Many still didn't get through, their valuable dispatches forwarded to Wellington, for whom they became an invaluable source of intelligence. The war in Spain would ultimately cost the lives of 240,000 French soldiers. As was typical in wars of this era, most died from disease. But more died fighting guerrillas than in battle against the British and Spanish armies. Wow. However, it was the twin threat, a well-led regular army under Wellington and a popular insurgency that left the French facing an impossible strategic dilemma. If their armies remained dispersed to fight the guerrillas, Wellington could attack. But if they concentrated to defeat Wellington in battle, huge swathes of the country would quickly fall to the guerrillas. This was Napoleon's Vietnam or his bleeding ulcer, as he called it. A war that cost his empire an average of 100 casualties every day, with little prospect of victory. And in 1812, as Napoleon launched his gigantic invasion of Russia, Wellington and the guerrillas launched their own offensive that would turn the war in Spain on its head. Thank you to all the patrons Okay, so that was Napoleon's Vietnam. Um, yeah, I really like this. Like the theme. Um, it's just really hard for conventional armies to fight guerrilla wars. I mean, you go in expecting to fight a conventional army, and everything about everything is different when you're fighting guerrilla forces. So, like it said, you can't just go outright attack the conventional army. Because the guerrilla forces will, you know, they'll cut your supply lines, they'll take all of your strategic positions, uh, they'll literally cut you off from the outside world, and then you can't just go turn on the guerrillas because there's a conventional army there. Um, they just, guerrilla warfare just totally changes the balance of, of conventional war. Um, Alright, so uh, I'll get to the next Napoleon video tomorrow. Like, comment, subscribe. Uh, we just got to 100 subscribers, two months in, 100 subscribers. Thank you all so much. I appreciate it. Um, yeah, I'll see you all next time.